right. Well, why don't we just get started? Um, I'm glad this is being recorded. Um, so welcome parents. There are gonna be some more joining us. We are in meeting mode. So uh, we will ask you to mute once Gina gets started, but like Stacy and Angela said, you can go ahead and ask questions in the chat. We will monitor from here. Um, I might pause Gina if some of the questions pertain to what you're talking about, and then we can have free discussion at the end. Even though we are recording, you know, if we wanna go into an, a more intimate discussion, we will turn that off. Like we can do things in post production before we post this out to the general public. So uh, regarding this meeting in particular, a lot of times we try to figure out our kids by talking to one another or we'll try something and we're kind of guessing. Uh, sometimes these efforts might end with frustration, but we thought at our last meeting, then why don't we go straight to the source, which is why we brought together a student panel. And we did this last year as well. And of course we were in person then and it was just so dynamic being in that room and the kids feeding off of one another as well as the parents just attentively listening. And I think same thing happened this past year. Everyone was kind of used to being you know, virtual um, that the panel was just as robust and gave us such great feedback. So um, if there were some parents that couldn't make it last time or at the last meeting, some of the things that we talked about were uh, how are students adjusting to COVID with the restrictions, their class workload? What are their biggest stressors? How are they navigating friendships and connections during the pandemic? How are they navigating mistakes and failure? What is the impact of phone usage and social media? Things like whether they compare themselves to others. Um, and then we also touched on what do they need from us as parents um, to support them or how to communicate them so it's nice that Gina is going to be with us. So now that we have those insights, what are we supposed to do with that? We welcome Gina Tober. Thank you, Gina, the oh. clinical services director of our local agency, Youth and Family Counseling. We've done a few things with you guys, so we appreciate you uh, being on this journey with us. Um, so go ahead and you can start join, walking us through some of these themes that we heard last month, shed some light on what we can do as parents. All right, I am going to share my screen. I have a, a PowerPoint uh, to help go through the conversation and also be a reference point for um, the folks who are watching this later. I'm gonna actually turn off my video because my share works better if my video is not on while I flip through. I will turn my video back on after are done sharing. All right. And Joy, if you could let me know when you can see my screen. Yep, I see it. Oh, awesome. All right. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Um, as Joy said, my name is Gina Tober. I'm the Director of Clinical Services at Youth and Family Counseling. Um, right here in Libertyville. I had the privilege of participating and sitting in on the Wildcat um, Health and Wellness panel last month and really enjoyed learning all about um, the teens and things that were going on. And I wanna take my first opportunity to say a big thank you to Joy, Stacy, and Angela because they created such an amazing safe space that those teens shared so much information. I was really, really impressed. Um, so I did wanna just take that opportunity to give you guys a shout out for all the work that you did creating that space for them. So in that panel, we heard the teens say a couple of pieces. Um, we heard them say we, they want their parents to be their space, safe space, to be proud of them and to tell them to not solve their problems, to trust us or trust them and be a support. They also wanted their parents to understand that they're really self-conscious they're very hard on themselves and they are trying really hard at all of the tasks that they're doing and they're learning about themselves. Um, one big theme was that they needed their parents, but they didn't really 
need their parents. Um, and to also remind us that even though they need those limits, they did not like them. Um, and finally, that they experience really big emotions. On the flip side of that, we also heard them say that they're using healthy ways to cope. They listed out a lot of very healthy um, current coping skills and they're using their supports, their friends, but also their parents when they need help. Um, they let us know that they're listening to their parents even when they're pretending like they don't, don't look like it and that they know that their parents really wanna hang out with them. Um, one of the, the pieces that I thought was really telling was that all three teens started laughing when they started to talk about the family game night. Um, they still need parents and that they have safe spaces in their homes and in their friends' homes. Before we get too much into a conversation, I wanted to first recognize how difficult parenting is. Um, it really isn't for the faint of heart. And this quote is from Anna Freud in 1958. So there are a few situations in life which are more difficult to cope with than an adolescent or son or daughter during the attempt to liberate themselves. So she's talking about these teenage years in 1958 and I have to imagine it has not gotten easier to parent teenagers since the 1950s. And on this call, we have so many experienced parents um, that as we go through the slides, if you have questions or comments or things that you do or experiences that you've had that you feel are helpful to share, go ahead. Um, you can chime in, you can send Joy a chat or you can hold it for the end. But I think that as a community sharing the things that have worked really well for us and our parenting strategies will be really helpful for our entire community. Um, Lisa Damore wrote this really fabulous, fabulous book and I actually referenced it in the back. Um, it's called Untangled. And she came up with the best metaphor for teenagers that I have ever come across. And so the, if you have not heard it, the metaphor goes that your child or your daughter is a swimmer and you are the pool and the world is the broad, the water is the broader world. So like any good swimmer, your daughter wants to be out and playing in the water. And like any swimmer, she holds onto the edge of the pool to catch her breath after going around a lap or getting dunked too many times. So your child is so busy with friends and activities in school that you barely see them. Then when something goes awry, she is seeking your advice and physical comfort. She comes back to the edge of the pool and clings onto you. So once she recovers, she will push off. And that push off is often very painful. And so just like when they were babies, they came to you like a reliable base. And you being the pool around the water allows your teen to take a couple breaths when something really rough happens. So your teen is out and has a big conflict with her best friend and is so upset and she comes to you crying and needing a hug and needing your attention and you give it to her. Right? You sit with her, you talk it out, you spend all this time together. She's taking that deep breath. She's getting back her balance and she's getting ready to swim again. And so when the push off comes is after you think you've reconnected, you are you know, sharing everything that's going on. You have learned so much about your teenager and they push off. So they come back to you when she recovers and says, uh, maybe in a painful way or a rude way or starting a snarky um, or a petty fight. And they push off to you because it feels uncomfortable for them to stay in that babyish sense. So that babyish sense of your parents coddling you and doing all the loving, warming heart activities that we do as parents to our children. Uh, but to a teenager, they want to be out and independent and active. Joy, did I hear you say something or no? Sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, so 
as you think about being swimming pooled, have there been times in your life where your teen has come to you needing help, needing support, needing love, and you gave it to them only to turn around and the next day have that feel like it's been pulled out from under you? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's painful. And so what Lisa Demore says is to anticipate this push off. So you know that after you have this really close, maybe you have this wonderful car ride or this really great um, mom and daughter or, or family time, anticipate a push off, anticipate your child being, picking a petty fight, saying something rude, um, acting like they don't need you any longer. Um, and Lisa Demore says, having the strength to stay in place when your daughter clings to and rejects you is very painful. And it usually requires the loving support of adult allies. Really great, Gina. It's a, it's a phenomenal book. It's really um, cool. And that leads me to the fact that like teens are really hard. They are very <laughs> hard. We, you know, you'll hear it a million times. Um, little kids, little problems, big kids, big problems. And everyone says, as we talked before we started this, um, you know, you have to manage yourself. You have to take care of yourself and build those pieces for yourself. But it's really hard as parents to focus on ourselves and our either um, physical, mental health when our teens seem that they need so much from us. And so as Lisa Demore said, creating those supportive allies. So really using your friends and your partner, your husband, your wife, your friends, this group is a phenomenal opportunity to do that, um, to create these allies in this support system. And so the, your support system can be the place that you go to cry about your teenager pushing off or something that was hurtful that was said or laughing about it and recognizing um, as it can become an adjective, you got swimming pooled. You know, I, I got really close with my daughter. We had this really great moment. And then she told me I looked terrible in these jeans. Like, ouch, like I thought these were my good looking jeans. And so recognizing and using a little humor with that can be really helpful. And so leaning on your supports. Uh, another piece to recognize is to identify when you're playing emotional hot potato with your child. And so your child comes home from school. You are so excited to see him. You just meet him at the door. How was your first day back and all in person? How is everything going? And he's like, oh, it's fine. And now your mood has gone from being excited and joyful and looking forward to talking to your son to kind of grumpy. And so recognizing when you're taking other people's emotions, even your child's emotions and letting them ruin how your day is going. And so your teen will yo-yo back and forth with, you know, loving and unloving attitudes. And you want to avoid picking up those unloving ones, which ruins your day and ruins all the enjoyment that you get from your child. This emotional hot potato, when it occurs, can ruin your really great day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great point because I, I have been, especially, you know, with my first one, I would ride the roller coaster, not realizing he's just venting or he's just telling me things that happened and I go in problem solving mode. And it's just, you know, he's not necessarily taking anything out on me. It's just, it made me realize that you know, don't jump in the sinking boat. Our job is to stand ashore and pull them out. So like be the source of comfort or be the, but it took me a long time to realize that because I would wear my heart on, on my sleeve and I would jump in with him. <laughs> Definitely happens. And even um, looking at this from a clinical perspective, your teen is out in the world doing things all day and having all these strong emotions. Right. And so parents can tend to be a lightning rod for things that are um, being carried around all day. I had a bad day. And so when they see you, 
and you say something that that hits them in the wrong fashion instead of you know yelling at their teacher who um, corrected them they yell at you and in the big scheme of things i suppose you don't want them to scream at their their teacher but it's also a way for the teenager to satisfy that impulse to react without having the actual consequences of it so they lash out at you because they know mom is always going to be there you know mom is not going to appreciate it you might get in trouble but mom is not going to stop loving you whereas if you lash out to your um, boyfriend or girlfriend that might change that might end the relationship right if you lash out to a friend friends might not have the capacity to, to bounce back from that. Um, so the, the other piece I have in here is modeling and teaching. How you manage your own emotions will be a big piece of how your team will pick up and manage their emotions also. And so when we will talk a little bit later about um, shaking off other people's emotions or giving it a little bit of perspective, it's helpful if you can start to do that for yourself because you can model it for your kids and then they can learn from you. And so one of the ways that the teens on the panel had talked about, excuse me, <coughs> uh, managing the anxiety and the depression that had come up for them was learning a couple skills and doing that in a in a various ways right they're talking to their friends they're watching how their friends manage stress they're talking to their parents and they're watching their how their friend how their parents manage their stress um, if you're curious how your kid will react at school think about how you react at work and if you're modeling that behavior the same behavior that you're seeing from your child when they're attending school um, some of the ways that the teens had brought up, which were really awesome um, at managing their emotions, were looking at the five senses grounding. And so I put these pieces up here as some actual tangible um, ways that you can use as a parent, but also things that you can use for your teen. So everyone probably has a Pinterest or at least knows what Pinterest is. And there are so many helpful pieces. Now your teen will not think that you are cool and that is okay because you probably shouldn't be the cool parent. But by sending them some of these pieces or encouraging them to explore some of them, they'll be learning in the same way that you set your expectations for things that might not be as fun. Like you need to drive the speed limit. Yes, it's more fun to drive fast, but you need to drive the speed limit. Um, and so recognizing that sometimes our teens start to panic and they need some help centering themselves. Um, especially with COVID, um, and we talked a little bit earlier before we started the presentation at Youth and Family Counseling, we have had a, a significant spike in calls for anxious teenagers, specifically feeling um, anxious and sad because a lot of their life has drastically changed, right? At the time where they are more social and practicing more independence, um, things got scaled back on them. And so three of these pieces are, um, two of these pieces are addressing some of those um, panic in the moment. And so um, the tactical breathing is actually a technique published by an army ranger. So he used it in preparation for um, deployment and in really high stress times. And so the technique is, as you can see on your screen, is to really breathe in through your nose for a count of four. It doesn't have to be a specific count of four. Um, hold your breath for a count of four, breathe out for a count of four, and then hold your breath for a count of four, and then start it over again. So this is a technique to start to regulate your breathing. It, you don't, it doesn't go on forever, but it will help get you better grounded into your body. And it's something that in the moment, if your child is having a really hard time catching their breath, it's kind of like the old school here, breathe into this bag. It can be a helpful technique and it's really easy to remember, which is why I put it on here. I think it's very easy to remember the four, four, four. 
Um, same thing with the five cents grounding. Um, the teens, if you participated in the panel, the teens um, really rem hung on to this. And I think all three of them heard it, if I, re if I recall. Um, so just getting yourself into back into your body and out of your head. Nice. Oh, I think I jumped a little ahead. I think I had one other thing I wanted to say. Sorry about that. Um, uh, so some of the tasks that um, parents can do is to really be proactive, like I said, to send your children a meme, um, something that you found, talk to them about something that worked, um, having you model it in those moments of being stressed. Uh, people will really pick up on those modeling behaviors. One of the other proactive pieces that you can do is to talk to your teen about how you can help them when they're starting to become panicked. And so um, some of the teams had, had mentioned having panic and panic attacks. And so recognizing if your teen has those meltdowns, they might not necessarily be full on panic attacks, but they could have experiences where they get very, very anxious and difficult to focus. So during that time, the amygdala is starting to go off. And so that's the warning center in your brain. And it's kind of like trying to talk to somebody who has a fire alarm going. And it's really hard to get settled and pull it together in order to problem solve or in order to just catch your breath. And so having those conversations with your teens and letting them know, you know, when you're really in your head, I want to be able to help you manage, but I'm not really sure what what would be helpful for you. Um, and sometimes they might come back with something and sometimes they might not, but giving them the opportunity to talk with you about what would be helpful so you're not trying to figure it out in the moment. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say is sometimes nothing is helping. And so sometimes when your child is very anxious or is really having a difficult time managing their stress, you don't necessarily have to say anything. You can let them know that you see that they're really upset and ask them if they want to you know, spend time with you, if they want you to be physically near them, if they need anything. But it'll be okay to give them some space to recover mm. because when they get into this very stressed, anxious mode, they cannot stay in that forever. And so eventually they're really going to crash and they're going to be very exhausted. Um, and then as you uh, circle back to them, you can let them know, I know that was really difficult. How are you feeling now? Um, some of the other pieces that the kids had said um, was using some apps. And so teenagers really, really engage in technology as I don't have to tell you all. Um, and so I pulled a couple of my absolute favorite ones um, for meditating. I love Headspace. I think the the voice is really um, nice, but they also have um, some meditations for different Daddy? ages. How are you? Okay, take it easy. Hi. Sorry, I thought there was somebody who had something to add. Um, and then the other piece was one of the big things that came up was limiting um, their screen time. And so the teens, I think all three of them also were really aware of their screen time. Um, Google and Apple have, you know, screen time um, uh, reports that can pop up for you. And then there are also some apps and my favorite one out of those is the Flora. It helps you like grow a little um, tree. And so if you are, or your child is, is interested in limiting the screen time, those are some interesting apps to check out. Um, and then I also wanted to um, let everyone know, I think it went out before on maybe the LHS what, um, Facebook account, but YFC is actually piloting um, a wellness app 
called YFC Thrive. And so currently we are piloting it, so it's free. Uh, we'll be looking to launch it maybe in May or June. Um, but if you or your child is interested in learning more or just participating, um, the website is right there. It's currently active and your child can go and sign up um, and, and see if it's helpful. Um, the three screenshots from pr the prior screen um, are some of the examples of the interventions in the YFC Thrive program. So how would that work, Gina, with that YFC Thrive app? If a student um, signs up, and mm -hmm. are, they, are they interacting with the therapist? Yeah, so the app itself is run by our um, clinical team, but it the focus of the app is not individual therapy. The focus is teaching wellness and monitoring your own wellness. And so there are a couple components. The first component is um, a word cloud to help your child and your, um, the target audiences, teens through young adults to monitor their own experiences. The second piece is teaching some skills. And so there are um, some uh, toolkits that get populated and some surveys to complete. And so um, those surveys and um, toolkits are populated by the clinical team. And then the third piece of that is an actual um, messaging within the system. And so the clinician on our end um, collects some information and says, oh, it, it seems like you're scoring um, really high in stress. Check out these um, pieces I populated in there and see if they help. And so there's an actual person on the other end. Okay, great. We would love any uh, participants um, as we are getting, getting it up and running and, and having a really good time with it. Thank you for that. There were two things that I just wanted to touch on on that previous slide, the apps that you had mentioned. Um, some of the students on the panel uh, actually are using these apps. I think they said, mentioned Headspace and Calm in particular. Um, so I thought that was interesting that they're already, you know, at this age um, savvy and using that. And then I also thought it was very impressive that they were using their limits on the phones, where it was actually a goal, you know, to bring down their their screen time usage, um, turning off their notifications. I think one of the students had said their friends were asking where she was, and she had turned off her Snapchat or um, turned off the notifications so that they're in control of their usage versus the technology using them. So I thought that was pretty impressive at, at that age as well. Yeah, and I, and I would venture to say that most teens have a good concept of how long they are on the phone and what their screen time is. Um, from my perspective, when I work with teens, it's usually a question I ask. And because it populates up on most phones on a weekly basis, if it's turned on, they usually have a really good idea of, oh, I was on my phone more or less. Um, during the week. But I, to Joy's point, I think it's very interesting that teens are also concerned about their use and not just parents. One of the biggest parenting fallacies is really trying to solve these problems for, for our kids. Joy, can you tell that, um, the boat metaphor you said earlier? Oh, I, I, I was just saying that it took me a long time to realize that, you know, our, our kids sometimes just want to get out what they're feeling or they're telling us about what happened. And that's what we want is for them to open up to us. But then when we react or we jump in the boat with them, like the sinking boat, what we really should be doing is standing on shore and pulling them out, like being their source of comfort. And, you know, at each, each time I would like, oh, and I feel like I have to do that or, you know, or offering words when I don't have to. It's just, um, just to be stationary and help them and pull them out of their ruminating or, 
what it is they're trying to get off their chest. Mm -hmm. I love that. I thought that was great. Um, so everyone on this Zoom um, has really earned their life experience. And there are lots of mistakes that as parents you saw yourself make that you really want your child to avoid. And it is really tempting to give them the solutions to their problems so they can avoid the pain, but that's not always what the role of parents are. And so looking at this is a time where your children are learning how to solve their own problems. Um, it's it's the the passage if you teach a man to fish right if you if you solve the problem for your child he solved the problem for the day if you help him learn how to solve his problems he'll solve his problems for his lifetime um, so in the next couple slides are some um, more concrete ways of encouraging your child to think through some of the problems and some of the experiences that he or she is having and so the first, the first piece is helping giving teens some perspective on problems, on conflicts, on emotions, on um, relationships. And so one of the best ways of doing this is providing some scaling questions. So scaling, scaling questions, excuse me, put limits on a problem so it doesn't seem all encompassing. And so the best example in your life um, experience is really looking at that pain scale at hospitals. They have the pain scale one to 10, the pain faces. So it kind of instantly reminds you that it could be like way worse. Like you broke your leg, but you didn't lose an arm. Okay. It's really bad. It's like an eight or a nine, but there's a 10 and you're, what is 10 out of 10 pain? And so scaling questions do that in the same way. It helps give some bookends to what is going on. Now I would not recommend asking your your teen, like it rank your problem one through 10. Um, but looking at it, like, is this a, is this a significant problem? Is this a big, medium or small problem? Is this something that's going to be like right now problem and not a problem in five years? Um, and also working on some of those bookend pieces, like what's the worst possible thing that could happen here? What's the best possible? And, and, and having that dialogue of what's kind of realistic. Um, I think it was Grant mentioned Denzel Washington's tweet. And so I found it and put it up here because it was phenomenal. And so if you have $68,000 and someone stole 60, would you throw away the rest of the money just for revenge or would you move on? And so we had that many seconds in a day. And so here's Denzel telling us, don't let someone's negative 60 seconds ruin the rest of your entire day. And that's a really good piece of, of perspective. And even coming from somebody who is, you know, outside of the family in the media is even better to have a healthy um, example. So I don't know if you guys had heard that one, but I thought that was fabulous. I had heard that one and the I wanted, you know, when you, I saw this slide, um, we did a lot of this around COVID. You know, um, I would say to my kids, like, I am so sorry, you know, that you're missing out on football season or that it's going to be postponed or, you know, those are like, don't diminish it. Like, those are hard things to deal with. But I said, you know, when your grandparents were younger, like, if, if they were 18, they could have been drafted into a war and they would have had to go and fight. And there were kids who were, you know, 18 who were dying or they, you know, we have a house, we still have a house. There's a lot of kids who don't even have houses anymore. You know, that I always try to give them those perspectives. And I feel like that really helped them to cope and go, you know what, maybe my problem isn't that bad because our, you know, there were there, we have this pandemic, but let's look at the other things that, that people have had to deal with that were much worse or in other countries that they have to deal with all the time. So I felt like this is something I use with my kids a lot. I, I have um, younger kids, but I use this with my kids all of the time. Um, one of the best quotes, and I put it in here, trust me, we've already thought of every solution. 
that was from one of the teens on the panel regarding how having their parents help them problem solve. Um, so problems are really opportunities for teenagers to develop an important skill. And so if you consider it a learning experience, um, you know, if you if you give a man a fish, um, it's the same concept. If you teach your child to solve problems, they'll be able to solve problems and be prepared for life. However, it is like the most difficult thing to do when your child brings to you a problem that you know the solution to. Um, so there are some really concrete steps to consider is the first one is to manage your emotions and your physical reactions. So this really means your like verbals and nonverbals. And so if your face is saying, what the world, he is not going to respond as well to that. Um, and instead of trying to interpret what your child should be feeling, just asking him, prompting him, or giving him the actual space to say, this is what's going on and this is how I feel about it. Um, prompting for your child to come up with what are, you know, how do you think you're gonna solve this problem? And most of the time they've come up with a whole big list of things. Some of them are gonna be really good and some of them are gonna be really bad. And so letting your child work that piece out, the example I put in here is like, I'm gonna punch him in the face. Well, like, obviously that's not really, we don't want to encourage our children to go and have fisticuffs with somebody. However, this is a good learning opportunity. Okay, that's how you know you probably would fantasize, but how would that play out? What could possibly happen about that? Um, and nine times out of 10, your child is gonna say, well, I mean, I really wanna do that, but I'm not gonna do that. Cause that would, you know, I would get in trouble or I would get kicked off of the football team or I would have bigger consequences. And so letting your child come up with what their solution is gonna be and being okay if it's the solution that is not the one that you would have chosen. And so it's really difficult to step back and say, um, you know, I think the best solution, I as the parent, is for you to confront your friend and have that conversation and, you know, work this situation out. If your teen is saying, you know what, I'm just not gonna talk to Sarah anymore. I just need a break from Sarah. I'm just not gonna respond to her text messages that's a learning opportunity to say, one, maybe that was the right call and Sarah will, you know, take, they'll both take some time and then they'll come back and talk it over. But also it's, it's helping your child have that real world experience about this is one of the ways that I tried to solve it. And if it worked for me this time, then maybe I can do it again. But if it did not work for me this time, if I ghosted Sarah and then Sarah um, decided she didn't want to be my friend, and that there were some negative consequences in there. Next time the problem comes up, your child will learn a different solution. So can I ask you a question about that? Jen? Yeah. So are you saying that if one of the things they decide to do, you should just let them do it, even though you think it might not be the best idea? If it's not a terrible idea, Mm -hmm. like, like if it's not, like not harmful <laughs> yeah if it's not something that's going to be very seriously detrimental so they decided they're never going back to school or um they're just they decide to do something that would be cruel like i'm gonna post online that you know sarah is horrible um then you want to have that conversation but the fact that they're sharing it with you is likely weeding out a lot of those pieces but if the, the problem is there was a miscommunication between two friends and you can really cl clearly see that, but they're feeling like they wanna try a different way of solving the problem. And it's not going to be, you know, they're not gonna end up getting kicked out of school or any of those big significant pieces. It's okay to let them try it in a way that you wouldn't have chosen. Oh, I think this, this whole slide hits right at the heart for me. <laughs> It, it's it's so hard. It's so hard. I like laugh when I saw it. Cause I'm like, yep, I resemble this slide completely. I admit it. Um, but you're also 
for your relationship with your child, you're also letting them know, I trust that you'll make a good solution. Like, I know that you'll be able to work this out. It's really tricky. But if you have other problems in the future, come to me because I'm not going to be judgmental and tell you you can't do that. That's great. And it's, it's hard. And then always um, the last piece on here is, is letting them know, like, if you want to talk about it more, come back to me. I'm here. If you want my opinion, I'll, I'll share it with you. But it seems like you've really thought of all, all that can happen. Um, and if you give a little uh, few prompting questions, like how would that play out? Um, could anything bad happen? And would you be OK with that? It'll wean, weed out a lot of those um, super problematic pieces that um, resolutions that teens come up with. All right. Um, so one of the other pieces the teens really talked about was having a non-judgmental parent and um, having a safe space in their home. So teenagers in general, um, and even the teens on the panel have a really difficult time interpreting how other people think about them. So if it's an ambiguous situation, they have already gone to the worst case scenario. And so this mind reading th thinking trap is really, really difficult to stop. And it's very common, particularly in teens who are very mindful of themselves and conscious of how they're acting in a situation. And so one of the teens on the panel had referenced being at a party and feeling so self-conscious that others were judging her that she just sat on her phone um, and just tried to look kind of busy. And then I think one of the other teens was like, yeah, I, I remember like those, those situations are difficult. And so in reality, most of the time, people are not thinking negatively about teens or, or about them, but it feels like that. Even, even the teens on the panel had recognized <clears throat> excuse me, that they get in their head about a lot of those things. Yeah, I, I just want to second that. Um, I found that part interesting. Um, I mean, we know as parents that this is an insecure age, but uh, these were confident kids on the panel. And, yeah. you know, one said, I don't really compare myself to other people. I just, that's not something that I you know, I remind myself, I don't know the whole story. Um, and so that part doesn't really shake her. It was the, if she gets a glance from someone at a party, or if, if she doesn't know how to read someone, that is what kind of shakes some of our teens. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's that, you know, ambiguous situation where then it starts, you know, they start to think and overthink and, um, I, I just found that part interesting where, uh, you know, usually maybe you'd be able to shake that off and say, oh, well, I don't know what they're thinking and just kind of tend to something else. But I think that was very telling of, of the kids um, in this age group. Definitely. Um, some tips to managing your, um, to be that safe harbor for your children is really when your teens come to you in that like swimming pool piece where they're really seeking your guidance and they're seeking your attention and they're seeking your love, recognize it as this is your time to shine. And if possible, give them your full attention. So if you are working on something, put it away the same way that you would want your teen to be talking with you and engaging with you. Um, put your phone down, turn the TV off, look at them, body posture and all. Um, a lot of times we as parents and even as teens have conversations with our phones in our hands, which can be exactly what we don't want to build. We want to build when you talk, I'm wholly there. Um, and having that parental attention on you when you're seeking it meets this really strong need within your child. Um, another huge piece is acknowledging your child's experience. And so not, um, like was said earlier, not downplaying the fact that um, things are really bad or something is going on and it's causing a lot of distress. It's okay to have that distress for your child. 
and it's it's okay to let them say this this is the worst thing ever nothing could be any better like this is absolutely horrible um because by normalizing like oh no it's really not it's 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 really not that bad it'll you you'll be okay you'll be okay in that moment the child is not going to feel like they're being heard and so recognizing like yeah that really is hard that's super difficult tell me about how you're feeling about it right and then which is excuse me um and and letting them have that time to express how they're feeling um and then looking at um I'm trying to remember her name who wrote the botox brow mm, michelle icard came up with the botox brow so when your child's telling you a story you don't really know if you're supposed to be upset or shocked or happy or what and so holding that kind of neutral face where you're really mindful of your nonverbals is really important because if they're telling you a story and you are getting very like oh i cannot believe it that's just horrible horrible and the story ends up like oh that was a really good story it's going to be kind of confusing and they're going to be like oh i thought that was a really good thing that i did but now you're really upset and so being really mindful of that um neutral face and this also comes into play when your child's friends are talking to you about their experiences or a story that's gone on and so being able to hold a neutral face will get you more information because the teens will want to like convince you of this is really cool or this is really upsetting um, and so it can be a really um, important tool in your tool belt um, the other piece is if you don't know what to say, you don't have to say anything. It's not a mandate that you have a response for everything that your teen or their friends share with you. And it's okay to say, wow, that's, that's really tough. That's super tricky. I'm going to have to think about this or like, I, I need a minute. Um, and then using that time to circle back with them. Like, oh, you know, I really was giving it a lot of thought how you talked to me about that problem you had with Sarah um have you thought about these options you know giving yourself some space and time lots of us take um function better when we have a little time to think about it and it helps us manage our own emotions about like i really hate sarah and so i really wish my child would stop hanging out with her because she's a bad influence um and then letting yourself work through those emotions and coming back with a couple of solutions for them The one of the biggest topics um, was the life 360. And so joy had prompted um, this first question that I thought was fabulous. Um, how does life 360 make you as a parent feel? Does it add to your stress? And why is that? Yeah, I, one of my uh, friends, and I have several friends who use it, um, and their kids are off to college. So it's, a, it's just a tool, like, I know when I used to use Find My iPhone um, for my kids, that I'd be able to sleep better at night thinking, okay, they're safe in their beds. That's not necessarily the case, but um, with Life360, it's, it becomes like addicting sometimes where, you know, you want to track your kid and, and just, it's better as for peace of mind, just to give them their space because they're growing as, as they go off to college too. Um, but just to pay attention to how it makes us feel as parents, if it's adding to our stress or if it's actually a helpful tool. And I don't believe any of the teens liked Life360. Mm -hmm. No. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that teens are very into the concept of fairness and truth. And so they see hypocrisy as uncalled for and ridiculous, and that's something to be raged against. And so being really honest about why and when you'll use Life360. And so recognizing, I, I added these three questions to kind of prompt parents to think about why do I have it? Is it straight for emergencies? 
Does my child need to earn my trust? Has he already earned your trust and proven to be accountable? Or is your child beginning a new independent skill and needs to be held accountable? So for those um, teens who are just starting to drive, like I'm gonna drive back and forth from school. So being really honest with your teen, hey, I want you to have this, you need to keep it on and I'm going to monitor it in this fashion. But also really checking yourself, are you monitoring it because you're really curious? And then what happens when you, when you get curious why they're at Culver's instead of at the library studying or why they're at you know, their girlfriend's house when they said they were gonna be heading home after school? Um, and what are you gonna do with that information? Um, and the other question for parents is, has it become a, a habit for you to check on where your child is in the same way that you know, Facebook or Instagram has become a habit for, for folks? Is it something that you need to monitor yourself? Um, and then as I was talking to Joy and actually I had the same conversation with um, one of my peers, using 360 to monitor your child's location when he goes to college, you could be very miserable trying to figure out why your child is at the places that he's at at the time frames that he is. Um, and, and ruining some of that excitement about, oh my gosh, mom, these are the cool things that were happening. Oh, I know because I thought I, I was watching you. I, I know just where you went, um, kind of sucks some of the joy out of the things that they want to share with you. But it also um, makes them realize that you're monitoring it more than, than they thought. And so a lot of the teens are turning it off on their phones and teens will probably always be more tech savvy than than you are, um, just the nature of the beast. And so it just comes down to the adage, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, so some, some things to consider, I don't know if anyone else in the group has used 360 um, in a helpful fashion or has any like concrete tips. Um, I have two more, well, three more slides, um, and one is references. Um, in terms of encouraging your child, uh, the teens on the panel really sought a lot of love and reinforcement from their parents um, and others, and they really wanted to hear their parents tell them that they were proud of them. Um, and honestly, this is coming from kids who knew their parents loved and adored them. Uh, so when we consider how self-conscious teens are uh, and how they take apart conversations in a way that would make your head really spin, um, that my mom loves me, but she if she found out what I did, then she probably wouldn't love me as much or she wouldn't think I was so great. Um, conveying that love and pride should really be like that old school voting um, in Chicago, like do it early and do it often. Um, when you say, I love you, smother them with love, but watch your butt. And so I love you, but I love you, but it's frustrating when we talk about your math. You know, I love you, but I really wish you could do these things. And the same way is, and I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you, but. And so that it might not always look like a very specific, but, but if you look at the example, um, you did a great job getting an A in English. I know you could get an A in all of your classes if you tried really hard or if you completed all your homework. I hear that phrase a lot in my professional capacity from parents because they see the potential in their kids. But there is a big difference in praising something and then giving that but that kind of undercuts instead of just straight praising it because praise will get you where you wanna go more than focusing on those negatives in this situation. And so instead of saying, I know you could get an A if you tried on all your classes, it's really focusing on the A. You rocked that A in English. You did, you worked so hard and I'm really proud of you. Um, some of the other pieces about praise is, is praising really sincerely. So if something is like, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to, you know, I want to, I want to encourage my child. And so these are some good things. Hey, by the way, you did a really good job 
with these things. Um, make it really sincere, something you're really proud of. You caught your child doing something um, really phenomenal. It doesn't need to be the big things. It doesn't need to be the A. It could be the, I know that it's really hard to get all of this work done and make it to practice in time, but I'm really impressed that you can do those things. Um, so praising the big things and praising the little things and not always the accomplishment pieces. So a lot of times the grades pieces drive a lot of encouragement and pride and they get a lot of that also at school. And so praising that work ethic for getting the grade is really important and that piece is not always given at the school because they're looking at the A, you did a good job, two thumbs up. Um, I wanted to add, which I thought was really cool, um, one last piece um, of love, because I love love. So the five love languages is something that probably everyone has heard of. Um, Dr. Gary Chapman came up with it a hot second ago. Um, and since then, they have an app and they have multiple quizzes. And so they have quizzes for um, like couples, they have quizzes for adults, they have quizzes for teens and actually little kids. Um, as your teens continue to grow, their desire for like snuggling and being close with you is going to decrease, right? Probably everybody has seen it. If you remember like little kids, they couldn't get enough of you and they wanted attention and love from you. And as they grow, trying to figure out the best ways to show them that you love them is like a new job. And so they have this quiz. And if you catch your teen at the right time and say, hey, take this quiz, it'll be interesting. You'll see what your love language is. They might just take it. Um, and it will let them um, know if they're, they're like primary and secondary, I think, love languages, whether that's words of affir affirmation, like you're doing a good job, keep it up. If it's just quality time, so spending time together, if they're into gaming, then game with them. If they're into, you know, tennis, play tennis with them. Um, the gift giving piece, it's not always that I am buying my child new things because they're fun and fancy, like the, the coolest shoes or um, new clothes. But some people, as, as lots of um, folks here, feel really loved when they get gifts. And so recognizing that maybe there are little gifts that you can give to your child to let them know that you're paying attention to them. So if they like to journal, giving them a journal. If they, you know, really want um, to be a physician, like buying them a little um, ornament at Christmas time, a little stethoscope, uh, doing little pieces of that, the acts of service, doing things for them, helping them with their room. Um, and then there's always that final, final um, physical touch of loving or hugging or like a little squeeze on the arm. Um, it's totally free. And it's very interesting. And if you yourself or you and your partner want to take it, I would strongly encourage it. It's kind of fun. All right. The last slide I have for everyone is probably two of the most recommended books at Youth and Family Counseling, um, focusing on girls, The Untangled, which is where I got the swimming pooled. Um, and Adam Price's He's Not Lazy. They're really um, easy to read, very helpful books if you're feeling like you just need a little bit of um, support and guidance as you're managing the teenage years. Oh, Joy, I think you're on mute. Were you talking? Sorry. And then when I was 10 years old, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I was saying that you've given us so many great nuggets um, and strategies for us to use, and you touched on so much here. So thank you very much. Uh, one thing that I heard from our panel was feeling judged by their parents. And uh, and not so much, you know, that we're 
hard on them or intentionally, it just might come out in conversation where um, one of the panelists said that where doubt creeps in is when their parents question um, either their thoughts or something they did. And um, let's see, I'm just looking back at my notes. Uh, since I'm still discovering my morals, I think, oh, maybe I'm wrong. Um, and I'm not saying, this is from one of the panelists, I'm not saying parents shouldn't question, it's just the way that it's said. Meaning, if a parent might say, oh, so you don't believe in what we believe. What the teens were saying is they don't know, they're still developing their thoughts on certain things or they're still figuring out who they are. So one question I have is how should we approach them then if we're just in the middle of conversation and um, they might feel that we're being judged either how do we kind of you know back out of it a little bit or how should we reframe you know our approach i guess mm -hmm. and i and i think that's really important because your kids are always going to assume that you're thinking something right mm -hmm. and so sometimes you can back out of it really quickly by saying I, this is just my face like using a little bit of humor to diffuse a situation can really, really, truly go a long way. Um, oh, like, oh, I, I didn't realize I was scowling. You know, sometimes I do that. Um, or letting them know I'm, I'm, I truly am interested and in being genuine. I truly am interested in what you think. I'm, I, I don't want you to pick up on my um, facial demeanor as I'm saying like what you're thinking is not correct. I'm just curious, I'm listening. Um, and, and working on developing that relationship with them so they feel like that's accurate. And no, particularly this year with the political climate, regardless of how households went, sometimes teens follow parents, sometimes they don't. Um, and it could be heated, very heated conversations um, in everybody's life. And, and recognizing that even if we have a, even if you think I disagree with you, I still really value what your opinion is. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like when you say neutral face, it's, it's neutral words too. Mm -hmm. like diffusing it and kind of rebalancing or recalibrating it back to a neutral position. Okay, I, li I like that. Um, in a previous conversation, uh, you and I were talking about setting aside maybe 15 minutes of the day mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about that to, to just connect with your kid? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I recommend to um, anybody who really comes to see me, but also to anyone, is dedicating at least 15 minutes a day to your child and catching up with them and chatting with them and um, doing some recreational something or other with them because you're building that this is our time to talk. And it's 15 minutes. And so not a single soul out there can say, I don't have 15 minutes to spend with a loved one. Um, and what you'll find is if you, if you dedicate those 15 minutes, sometimes it'll be eight minutes, but sometimes it will be like 30, 40 minutes. And you might hit your child at the right time that they share everything that's been going on. Oh, by the way, I have a new girlfriend. Oh, I had no idea you had an old girlfriend, like do tell. Um, and so building that into your relationship with your child and letting them know, hey, I want to check in with you for like 15 minutes every day, whether you have something significant to tell me or not, um, we'll start having that relationship. And if they um, come to you and they are in a, in a terrible space and you say, hey, I want to catch up for 15 minutes and they say, I can't even talk to you right now, mom, right, which happens. And you're like, okay, I'll give you some space, but you should know I'll, I'm going to circle back. And so you just circle back. Hey, I know it seemed like you were having a really difficult time. Um, what's going on? You want to share anything with me or do you just need some more space? And so letting them know that even if they have ruined the 15 minutes with um, their attitude, and as we definitely know from our own kids, but also from the teen panel, they feel terrible when they hurt your feelings. They then go back into their room and they're like, I can't believe I just yelled at my mom. I'm really, I'm not mad at her. Um, having that circle back to say, I, I know that you had a rough time. I don't want to be talked to like that. Or I know that you have a lot of stress going on, but I just want to check out and see what's going on. Is everything okay? 
I really like that strategy or that tactic um, because if you are setting aside 15 minutes that, that like you said, could be eight or 30 and it starts to become a habit, I think our kids will look forward to or just know that it's coming that, oh, I want to tell mom this when the time comes, you know, like they'll start queuing up some of the things that they might want to share just because it becomes part of their day. I like that. I have to tell my mom something, so I might as well tell her this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this is great. And um, if, you, if you think back to some of your childhood, like some of the annoying things that your parents did, right, that be, then became habits and then you would do them. Like if you had a, like a game night or you had a family dinner or if um, for me personally, I had to check in with my mom every time I came home. Um, and the joke was always she needed to make sure we weren't drinking. That's why she wanted a hug and a kiss every time we walked through the door. That was the requirement. And now we joke about it with her. But those were important pieces that were built in and just settled on. So for all her kids, we all did that. Mm -hmm. I like that. I'm going to have to implement that as well. <laughs> I'm teasing, buddy. Um, and then I also liked um, how you said sometimes we can just be quiet. Um, I think sometimes parents feel they need to offer advice or say something to react. And sometimes keeping quiet is the best, you know, medicine for that, that time, that situation. If, they're, if our kids just need to vent or, or um, release, you know, some things as, as they get home from school. But um, I'm going to open it up to the parents. Do we have any questions um, or things that you want to bring up that Gina had covered in her presentation? Anything from the panel that you might want to explore or discuss? Okay. I was going to say, does anyone else's kids want to open up always at 11 p.m. at night? Yep. <laughs> like he always wants to talk when I'm ready to go to bed. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Is that a thing with everyone else? I I hear that a lot. Okay. Do you think it's because like start revving up or something? Uh -huh. Well, if they've been up, they were at school, which requires a lot of their energy, right? They came home kind of burnt out. They had to do their homework and do their socializing piece and got it all out. And now they're like a little bit tired. They're like wanting to connect. You know, that's the same time that all their friends are probably going down at the same time. And it's the worst possible moment for parents because you're exhausted from all the stuff. Um, but recognizing, can I give my child 15 minutes? at 11 o'clock, right? Cause you're probably not gonna get it at like eight o'clock in the morning when you're feeling really energized and ready to have explore all sorts of emotions and, and issues going on. Yep, yep, I've had to stick it out a few times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna call you at 11 o'clock tonight, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanna say thank you so much. Um, if our parents don't have any, any questions for Gina, um, I so appreciate your time. Um, and for us parents, I just want to reiterate something my, my good friend Jim Connell said, Joy, we've never done this before. We've never raised teenagers. We're all kind of going through this, you know, for the first time. So we have to cut ourselves some slack. But um, thank you for walking us through a lot of these insights that we heard at the last uh, meeting uh, from the panel. They did such a phenomenal job of letting us into um, their lives, their friends' lives. So thanks, Gina, for kind of closing the loop for us. And um, I will send out your uh, email address on a final, you know, on, on an email when we um, uh, push out the recording, if you don't mind, in case some parents might have some questions or follow. Oh, that's absolutely fine. Okay. And as Gina said, you know, please lean on us too. We're all in this together. So we're trying to create a community where parents can um, give and take information, share with us things that worked for you. Um, that would be very helpful. So thank you so much. Thank you everybody for joining thank us. You so thank much. you for having me. Yeah, it's really informative. Thank you so much. So appreciate it. Everyone have a great night.
I just wanted to um, say thank you for having me. I had a really good time. Yeah, no, this is so great. I mean, just, you know, as we were going through the different themes and like going back and I was kind of cruising through my notes here um, just because they let us into so many different aspects um, that I wanted to make sure that we covered or circled back, but you addressed everything. So um, thank you. Thanks for your time and all this. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, you guys are doing a phenomenal job. I think this is such a great, um, such a great support for parents. I hope so. Oh, it really you. is. Oh, that was, I got to tell you, some of that was really dead on. <laughs> I know. I was like, screenshot. <laughs> I need to read that again. <laughs> Angela, this is like what we were talking about after the panel. I'm like, oh my gosh, I just feel like, you know, I wish I would have known all this. And in talking with you, Gina, I'm like, oh my gosh, can you raise my kids like my poor kids, you know? And I, I, well, I told Joy, I have the most emotional um, little kids in the entire world. And they will let you know all of the emotions that they're feeling. And they need a lot of time to take a deep breath. Oh. But I do feel like just for them to release and get it out, it's so helpful for them versus the opposite, which is keeping it in, you which know? I have. I've, I've got boys, like they don't, it, well, my older one, I'm afraid one day is going to just explode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, it does nothing. Yeah. Um, we were uh, all together with a, a bunch of different kids um, this past weekend. And one of them is, he's 22. And Ella was with her friends and they were just ban like talking about relationships and this and that and how girls feel about certain situations. And he's like, this is the perspective that I needed. We don't talk about this kind of stuff as guys. We don't process it like this. You know, we just hold it to ourselves. Whereas the girls feel so comfortable in sharing. So, I mean, that's why I think it's so helpful to have a relationship because then they can open that, you know, open up to yeah. Someone who's used to that and allowing that and asking for that. But absolutely. I'm absolutely. I totally agree, Joy. That's why I know Rocco's become really good friends with Grace, who is on our panel. Mm. And, and, and I'm always like, okay, tell him this. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have those plants. Yeah. Those molds, molds. <laughs> he really needs to work on this. It's <laughs> like, I know. You know what though, Angela, um, just with Shannon, spending time with Shannon, Skinner, yeah. Yeah. she's like, oh my gosh, Mrs. LaVista is so nice that when we spend time with our kids' friends and creating that safe place, like we were talking, you, you mentioned, Gina, um, they feel comfortable in opening up to us, which encourages our kids to open up, you know? And then, and one other thing I wanted to add uh, that, uh, Grace had mentioned was the sleepovers if kids don't want to go home. <gasps> oh, that's right. You oh, know, no. they want it broke my heart. They want to sleep over because they don't feel comfortable at home, you know? Yeah. And um, I was, I didn't know how to mention that or if I should mention that, like FYI, if you see that for a couple of days in a row, you know, just maybe you might want to open that up to your kid and ask what, what it's about kind of thing. That one struck right at my heart, man. That was, that was tough. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, Gina, thank you. It's 820. Um, you're awesome. You. Yes. You are so great. Thank, thank you. you. It was really fun. Um, I'm glad you think it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Like I was, my husband was like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I'm going I'm to put this PowerPoint together. He's like, do you need one? I was like, yes, I need one. <laughs> So hopefully it was like full of resources and things that people can yes. use. You can pick up one or two things and then it's absolutely great. Yes. No, lots of great strategies in there. So thank you. Oh, All yeah. right. Have a good night. Thank you very much, ladies. Bye-bye. Yeah,